medications used to restore function in afflicted patients. Dr. Suthana's research and feats of engineering have earned her multiple awards and honors, including an NIH Brain Initiative Grant, a McKnight Technological Innovations in Neuroscience Award, a Keck Junior Faculty Award, and a Joseph John Foundation Friends Scholar Award, just to name a few. But it's not only Dr. Suthana's rigorous and brilliantly innovative science that makes her a pioneer. One look at her leadership accolades reveals that her commitment to challenging scientific norms extends well beyond the lab. She was awarded a postdoctoral mentoring award in 2019 and continues to contribute to efforts aimed at increasing educational and career opportunities for women and underrepresented minorities in her role as the Associate Director of Neuroscience Outreach for the Brain Research Institute at UCLA. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Nanthia Suthana in presenting her talk, Space and Memory, Insights from Intracranial Recordings in Freely Moving Humans. Thanks, Emma. Very kind introduction. Thanks for inviting me to all the organizers and thanks for joining participants. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Share screen. All right, hopefully that's working. All right, so uh, I thought Today I'd give an overview of a, a few different projects going on currently, uh, as well as just speaking a little bit about some previous work that some, some of you may be already familiar with. Um, even though we have questions at the end, please feel free to interrupt me uh, if you'd like me to expand on a particular slide further. Okay. All right, so for, for since the beginning of my career as an undergrad researcher, I've been very interested in memory, episodic memory particularly, and this is the type of memory for personal events. So learning, you know, things as simple as, you know, what you had for breakfast this morning to more, uh, you know, uh, important uh, events such as, you know, birthday parties and weddings and things like that. Now, in the real world, these memories are formed within a spatial and temporal context, within a spatial environment, but also most often, you know, occurring during social interaction, in the presence of others, and not just with oneself. So understanding how the brain represents space, but also how, you, how it uses this information to form memories for events and support their retrieval later on has been an interest of my lab. Uh, we started about I guess, seven years ago now. And uh, we've been very interested in looking at this from the perspective of you know, using intracranial recordings in recently in freely moving humans. Of course, the uh, motivation for this comes from <clears throat> many, many patients worldwide who are unfortunately afflicted with disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, which affect you know, the brain systems that are important for forming these memories such as the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex, which you can see here. And these types of memories are also affected, unfortunately, in patients who have traumatic brain injury, and in particular, the patients that we work with, uh, medial temporal epilepsy patients, which affects you know, millions of people worldwide. Uh, this problem of memory disruption is not something that has you know, necessarily been decreasing and uh, will likely increase, unfortunately, over the next many many years and decades. The treatments for these disorders are minimal and not always effective. And so one other aspect of my lab is trying to not only understand the neural mechanisms of episodic memory and spatial navigation, but also how we can potentially inform and develop new treatments. So we mostly focus on uh, the hippocampal and orinal regions, which are part of the larger medial temporal lobe. And we're very highly motivated from studies in freely moving animals. Uh, these studies over the past several decades have found many different uh, cell types and phenomena that occur uh, in rodents, for example, freely moving rodents, such as the you know, famous cells that respond when an animal's in a particular environment, play cells, and also in a grid-like pattern as they traverse the same environment, uh, known as grid, cell, uh, grid cells in the entorhinal cortex. There are other types of cells, I won't talk about all of them here, but to mention one other that's relevant for this work I'll present, are border cells, and these are cells that respond uh, when the animal is near borders, or in this case, you know, environmental walls. Uh, other types of cells in the brain that perhaps may have some relevance to this talk here are cells that respond every time an animal is performing a particular action, but also when they're observing an another uh, animal carry out that same action, known as mirror neurons. 
And then uh, more recently, cells have been discovered in the freely moving rodents and also bats, where they respond not only to an animal's particular location in space, but also when another animal or conspecific is in a particular space, so selected for a space for this other animal. So both self and other, these are known as social place cells. And these cell types uh, also have a very interesting relationship to ongoing oscillatory activity, particularly in the theta band around you know, seven, eight hertz uh, in the rodent, freely moving rodent, which is dominant during movement, during walking behavior, but also uh, has particular relationships with the ongoing spiking activity of these play cells, these grid cells known as uh, you know, phase procession. Now, in humans, being able to do these kinds of studies, unfortunately, is challenging and has not been possible because the neuroimaging techniques that we use in humans require individuals to remain motionless. And this is for various reasons, you know, one in that uh, these kinds of movements, even just subtle head movements, ca can cause severe artifacts to the signals of interest, particularly in the case of, for example, functional MRI, PET, MEG, et cetera. Uh, these techniques, when they do allow for some movements in the case of scalp EG, unfortunately can't record well from these deep brain areas like the medial temporal lobe. And these signals usually reflect sort of larger populations of activity. However, and, and the last point is that because individuals are, are restricted to these immobile um, you know, uh, settings, they, have, they cannot, you know, for instance, use uh, head-mounted displays where you can look at you know, head movements and um, other self-motion related cues, but uh, they have to be still. And so what they do is they look at a screen that's projected or a pair of goggles, or in you know this case over here, a laptop uh, that's sitting in front of them. And because of that, the tasks that are presented are often you know, a presentation of two-dimensional stimuli, or in some cases, you know, view-based virtual reality environments where uh, you can simulate the 3D sort of movements through space. But again, the person is motionless, immobile, and uh, you know, we're unable to really look at these other factors that, that are related to self-motion. Now, I will say these studies have contributed um, a number of very important insights uh, by creatively using view-based virtual reality during brain activity measurements and also combining it with you know, some virtual reality head-mounted displays, but before and or after the uh, brain activity has been measured. Um, so that being said, there are still outstanding questions in terms of, you know, for example, the, the relationship to self-motion cues and other complex uh, stimuli in real-world environments. And also, how do these findings really bridge and connect to the freely moving rodent studies and animal studies that I showed you in the last slide? So that's really what my lab has been trying to do is fill in some of these gaps between the animal and human studies. And we're able to do that with a clinical opportunity that came uh, about nine years ago now in 2013, where the FDA approved a system, a chronically implanted electrode system for patients with epilepsy. And so this system, as you see here, illustrated is permanently placed uh, in, in the basically in the skull, um, the, the electronics and the battery, and they're connected to two depth electrodes that are often placed in the medial temporal lobe. The system is uh, able to record intracranial EEG, so oscillatory activity from the medial temporal regions through four bipolar contacts that you can see here, example of one of these depth electrodes with four contacts located in area, you know, subiculum of the hippocampus. Here's an example participant who is willing to be videoed, and uh, you can see a little a device here that's placed actually right on top of where the underlying implanted system is to deliver some, uh, uh, to basically deliver a signal that allows us to synchronize the activity with the external world. What you're all, also going to see is uh, the participants wearing a motion tracking suit, which has little reflective markers that can be tracked with these motion capture cameras on the wall. Because the system is fully implanted and there are no externalized wires, you can also use scalp EG, mobile scalp EG, where the amplifier is placed in a backpack that they can carry. And then last but not least, you'll see the individual wearing a virtual reality headset, which since this video was taken, uh, we've had many, many new headsets come out. Um, but what they can do, all of them, is simulate a real world experience with 
you know, researcher control uh, and integrate it with motion tracking or synchronize it with the motion tracking. So without further ado, I'll show you the video. These are the motion uh, sensor, you know, that are placed on the body. You can do full body tracking or just simply, you know, head uh, direction and head movements if you wanted to keep it simple. So uh, we use a variety of different VR headsets, um, some that have a little bit more you know, uh, resolution than others in terms of how much you can really show and the latency involved. Uh, and you can see that they can walk around freely without any you know, wires connected and uh, we can measure brain activity simultaneously. So here's an example of some data from one participant. They're walking around here. We're using a slightly different setup that allows for better synchronization. So there is a metal frame that is uh, sitting over the head. We also can do eye tracking, pupil size measurements. And you'll see here in this video, the gaze position. So where the individual's looking and down here, their position in the room from a top-down perspective. And here is the intracranial EG from four channels in the medial temporal lobe. Now, all, all, during all of this time, we are standing outside uh, while we are able to view this activity in real time uh, streaming from the backpack that the individual is carrying. So just to give you a little more detail about the technical aspects of this setup, this, these devices over here are what are carried in the backpack that the participant is, is wearing. Um, it's basically a a laptop, what we call a programmer, that is able to stream the real-time data to us um, over, you know, basically the network using an extra device that we add, a Raspberry Pi in this case, which also allows us to control the system in terms of starting, stopping the recording, delivering stimulation, etc. There is a wand that is developed is it comes with the system that the patient themselves has, and we're able to set it up such that it's the, its weight is relieved through this you know, metal carrier. And patients or participants can wear this for several hours per day uh, you know, comfortably without much complaints. In this photo here, we have a picture of an augmented reality headset, which we are also exploring in terms of uh, not immersing someone in a virtual environment, but using the real world environment and adding uh, stimuli on top of that space. You can also do stationary experiments. This is very useful for bridging some of the findings between laboratory-based tasks. And then <clears throat> we have a light version, which you saw in the video previously, which just includes an electromagnet placed uh, right above the device, which delivers basically a magnet uh, artifact into the data that allows for synchronization. So there are multiple different types of setups, depending on how, how much, uh, you know, how much of a reduced latency you want in terms of synchronization of data. If you need millisecond resolution, then this is really the way to go at the expense of slight uh, discomfort in terms of wearing <clears throat> this whole backpack, which weighs about nine pounds. So one of the first studies we looked at was simply just recording MTL activity while individuals were walking back and forth in the room, as well as in circular environments. So here's an example sped up trajectory of someone walking back and forth. Red is showing their head direction. And then you'll see they start to go around in circles. And we randomized these movements. Uh, and this was all done in the real world, not in virtual reality. Uh, the body position was tracked and uh, the intracranial EG activity was analyzed offline. And what we found in these participants was that, well, we were looking initially for theta oscillations, which are very dominant when, an, when a rodent is running around. And uh, we didn't see that initially. We did see some uh, evidence for these oscillations, but they were quite infrequent. And you could see a little bit here around eight Hertz where the activity is increasing in power, but in short bouts that is not continuous as it would be in the rodent. But what we found is when we looked at this analytically is that these bouts were more prevalent when the person was walking at faster speeds, which is shown in gray, uh, versus slower speeds or completely you know, not moving at all. And that was indeed significant across the participants where we saw increased prevalence. So basically percentage of the signal which was rather low, about 10%, uh, compared to at least rats, where you see this 
you know, 80 plus percent of the signal, um, we saw that it was much more, you know, not much, you know, a few percentage more, um, at least significantly more in the fast uh, walking trials. And this was also the case for a participant that happened to be congenitally blind and also had epilepsy implanted with one of these participants. The prevalence was much, was much higher in this individual, uh, about 30 plus percent. We saw evidence for the harmonic, which is consistent with animal studies as well. All right, so following up to this study, we wanted to understand, you know, what other variables modulate these theta bouts that are occurring during walking behavior in humans. And one hypothesis we had was that perhaps memory or, uh, you know, certain type of spatial navigation task may modulate these activities. And so uh, Matthias, a postdoc in my lab, designed an experiment where they not only were walking around the room, but they had specific instructions on uh, to look for hidden locations that were triggered by, by sound. So find, for instance, target location T, and once they arrived at this location, there would be a sound that would be presented uh, to the participant to mark that location. And they did this repeatedly with uh, a few different locations in the room, again, all hidden, uh, and then interleaved with those trials, they were asked to um, they were asked to just simply go to a cue on the wall. So go to yellow four, for instance. So go to yellow four, then find target T, go to a red three, find target S, so on and so forth. Um, what was you know, interesting about this design is that we also included a separate condition where the participants sat in the corner of the room and watched the experimenter, in this case, Matthias, uh, walk around the room and do the same task. The, the instruction to the participant was to press a button key every time Matthias crossed a previously learned target location, for example, T. Over here shows example trajectories of the individual as well as Matthias's trajectories over the course of an, an experiment. So we're getting quite good sampling across the whole environment, which allows us to look at brain activity uh, with respect to different positions in this environment. And also what happens when a person is sitting and watching another person maneuver through that same environment. What we found, one of the first uh, parts of series of, of findings was that we saw that theta gamma, theta and gamma activity, so this lower frequency and higher frequency activity, increased every time uh, individuals were closer to the environmental boundaries, so basically the walls of the room. So if you look just at uh, the difference between power, you know, between extra, you know, interior inner areas versus boundary areas, we saw a statistical significant across all the participants and also within each participant. So it was a quite, you know, consistent finding within individuals as well as across the whole group. What was interesting is that this effect also occurred when they were sitting in the corner of the room and watching Matthias walk around the room. So as they were sitting in the corner, their theta and gamma power increased when Matthias was walking closer to the environmental walls compared to the inner areas. Um, this is showing an example plot from you know, one of these channels uh, where this white line shows the threshold cutoff between outer and inner areas. However, we did play around with this area and, uh, and uh, looked also at putting you know, distance, using distance to the wall as a linear variable and found that you know, really there was more of a linear relationship between theta power and proximity to the uh, wall boundaries. So here's a video example trial. Looking at this, what you'll see is the participant is walking as they get closer to the wall, theta power goes up. And then in this video, they're actually sitting in the corner right over here and watching Matthias walk. As he approaches a wall, you'll see also theta power increases. All right, so here is each individual participant just to show you that it's quite consistent and also between self and other. So this is self-navigation and observation. And uh, what we then decided to do is break up the data by uh, condition in terms of the task, right? So as you may have remembered in the beginning, I told you that there were two instructions for the participants. One was to 
walk to a queue on the wall. And then one was to go find, you know, target T. And so we broke this up. Um, this is referred to as no target search. So you're simply walking to a queue on the wall versus target search. You're, you're searching for this hidden item in memory. And so if you split that data up, what, what Matthias found is that low frequency power also increased, but only during the target search period. So this boundary effect was driven really by the target search periods when they were looking for targets rather than just simply going to the wall queues. He also looked at various other things like uh, whether you were approaching or leaving a wall, uh, approaching or leaving a target, um, your you know, sort of direction to the wall queue, lots of, lots of different variables that we include in supplementary, supplementary materials, which suggests that it's not the strongest uh, you know, variable or the variable that most explains the variance in this data is proximity to the wall. In the observation condition, this distinction is not as clear because the participant that's sitting in the corner doesn't hear the instructions in the task. So Matthias is walking around and he has Bluetooth uh, earphones that are telling him to go to the target T versus go to you know yellow two, and the participant doesn't hear any of this. So we can't divide it up uh, in the same way. But what they are doing is they're pressing a button every time he cr uh, crosses target T. So what we could do is we could split the data up by before button press versus after button press. And that's what we did. And if you think about what this means, you know, before button press, um, they're really searching you know, for this target T in memory, right? So they're trying to remember where target T is. So they're doing somewhat of a target search kind of process we call it target ahead versus after they press the button, you know, they're not doing this, right? They're simply just, you know, watching Matthias walk to the wall. So in that way, these, these conditions can be thought of as somewhat similar, at least in, in the case of searching for a target. And what was interesting is that these effects were also there in this division of these two conditions. So the boundary effect was driven by the conditions during which the participant was um, observing during a period where there was a target ahead, right? So target ahead, you see activity increases when the person is walking near a boundary versus when there is no target ahead and they're simply walking to a wall queue that, that is not showing this boundary effect. Um, Hugo Spears wrote a nice commentary and, uh, adapt and basically summarized these findings in an illustration which Matthias has adapted here, which I thought really explains well you know, what we're seeing. And so we're two, two main uh, take homes here is that this low frequency activity and high frequency gamma, which I didn't focus too much on, but we also saw it, is modulated by the distance to the boundary such that you see larger amplitudes, larger power for positions that are closer to the wall, so in black, versus in, in the interior of the room in red, and that's illustrated here. However, this is only occurring when they're looking for a hidden target. So prior to this hidden target, not after they've found this hidden target. So in green, that distinction between boundary and inner area is not affecting theta power. So boundary related medial temporal activity is modulated by the task goal, whether they're looking for a hidden target or walk simply walking to a uh, wall queue. The second thing we wanted to look at, uh, aside from these effects is whether we could replicate the findings from that very first study I showed you, where we found increased prevalence of theta power during high versus walk, uh, slow walking speeds. And what was interesting in this data is that we did see it. However, we only saw it during the periods of no target search. So remember, I showed you target search versus no target search, and the boundary effects were driven by target search. The speed modulation of theta actually seems to be the opposite and seems to only occur when they are not looking for a uh, target. So you can see here is no target search. Positive means that there's higher theta power during high speeds versus low speeds. And that was uh, significant for um, self-navigation. We, uh, we of course, we didn't see this in observation, but again, remember they're not actually moving in this case, they're sitting in a corner. Another thing we wanted to look at was eye movements. And uh, this is building upon findings in non-human primates, Beth, Buffalo lab, Beth Buffalo's lab and others um, showing that theta activity increases you know, with saccade-related activity. 
And so eye movements we, we can capture because the individuals are wearing this eye tracking, uh, wireless eye tracking headset. And so we looked at theta power with respect to saccades and fixations, and we did see that theta power was increased during saccades versus fixations consistent with this previous work and both in self-navigation and observation. But only, what was interesting is it only occurred during the target search and target ahead periods, not in the no target search or no target ahead period. So similar to the boundary effects uh, in that these saccade related effects were modulated by task goal and were only present during these you know, periods where they were searching for this hidden target. Uh, one more finding that we're looking into is this uh, hexadirectional modulation of theta, which has been looked at quite extensively by other groups using fMRI and intracranial EG in stationary individuals uh, doing virtual reality spatial navigation tasks. The uh, analysis is illustrated in this figure, uh, which capitalizes on the fact that grid cells have this orientation topography to them such that uh, you can measure brain activity uh, relative to the orientation of those grid cells. And um, the hypothesis is that as the individual is walking through the environment, if they're walking in a direction that is aligned with the underlying grid cells, so basically like right here, or right here, or right here, then the brain activity would increase during those aligned periods, which is shown in green, uh, versus the unaligned periods or misaligned periods, which is shown in gray. And this has been shown with fMRI as well as intracranial EG, um, looking at theta activity in the entorhinal cortex. And uh, what we wanted to see is whether we find this. The, the difference is that in our study, they're actually moving around so we can look at walking direction uh, instead of like virtual direction in a, you know, to, in a VR environment. And we did see this in every single participant that was uh, did, that did the study. So we see higher theta power for aligned positions versus misaligned positions. And here's each individual participant, and below is an example participant just showing the modulation with uh, you know, basically 60 degree um, symmetry. This, what was interesting about this is that we saw it both during self-navigation and observation. So remember in this condition, they're simply sitting in the corner of the room watching another person walk around and their theta, their theta activity is modulated by the walking direction of the other person, right? So it's no longer their head position, it's the other person that they're watching. Uh, and this, as far as I know, has not been done or found in either animal uh, studies or humans. And the next study I wanted to talk to you about is how we're using virtual reality to test some of these questions and explore these uh, topics further. Here's an example study um, where Sabrina, a MS MD PhD student in the lab, has designed to look at memory. So they're, they're walking around and instructed to learn these halos that you see that are in different colors. Uh, and they also have to walk to arrow cues, which are not, uh, they don't need to remember those locations. It is a memory test, so they have to later go to those halo locations and press a button every time they think they've arrived. And so we can measure their memory across multiple repetitions of this task. Um, they can also do this task sitting, which we have data for as well, as well as freely moving, and we can measure you know, eye movements and eye position. So we've looked at the participants who've been in the study so far, which I believe we have five now, and uh, see at least behaviorally, that their memory improves over the course of the study. So what we're showing you here is error, so distance to the halo. So um, a, a shorter distance means essentially that they re remember the precise location, and so they're able to push that but button uh, you know, closer to the actual location of the halo. They don't see the halo during these retrieval conditions. They're just simply asked to go to the location and press a button. And so you can see the error, you know, starts out a little bit higher, especially in some participants, but over time gets lower and lower. Um, this task had shifting conditions between two environments, so they slightly get worse when they shift, and then they, you know, kind of normalize down to um, a reduced error. One participant seemed to do a little bit worse than others, um, driving some of this variability. 
This is looking at an overview, top-down view of the trajectory of uh, example participant. And in colors, you see the different halo positions for that particular person. So in this study, we've also found boundary-related activity. So we wanted to replicate our previous findings. And we see theta activity or low-frequency activities increased when individuals are walking near the walls. Um, but we also find something else that's uh, a little bit new in that the theta activity also increases uh, at the positions where they're retrieving those previously learned halos. So in this condition or this data set, they do not see any of these visible halos because this is retrieval. Um, rather, they are walking to a position and pressing a button when they think they've arrived at, at this location. Here's an example from one participant. You can see higher power near those halo positions, and again, significantly um, across all trials. And then if you look at the time course relative to their arrival at their remembered location, you see theta powers increased slightly, you know, a few hundred milliseconds before their button press, but only for correct trials, not for incorrect trials, and not for the encoding you know, visible trials where they actually see a halo. So we think that this effect is driven by the memory retrieval, particularly when they are correctly re retrieving those uh, locations. All right, to summarize all of this, um, we see theta and gamma activities modulated, well, in this case, theta activities modulated by walking speed. We also see it's modulated by proximity to boundaries. <clears throat> we see um, memory retrieval, <coughs> excuse me, modulation, as well as the particular task goal when they're searching for hidden locations versus simply walking to a queue. We also see theta is modulated by walking direction in a hexadirectional way and the presence of others. So it's modulated by the position and walking direction of another person. And then lastly, we see that it's modulated by eye movements. So a lot of different things going on here. I think our main challenge is to really um, tease apart the relationship between all of these and the complexity, which is something that, you know, sort of an upside and a downside to doing uh, these freely moving studies in that you have more complexity in terms of behavioral variables, but then, you know, if you can tease them apart, you can really start to understand what's going on in naturalistic behaviors in the real world. We have a study that is close to finishing. I think we have one more participant that we'll be testing, um, looking at these activity patterns outdoors and outside. And so they're walking a route around UCLA campus particularly a very confusing route that they are tasked to learn. And so they do this many times over the course of the day while we're recording video, audio, eye movements, and uh, various other things using wearable sensors. So this is a sped up video of what they're doing. One interesting aspect of the study is that they are walking in and outside of buildings. So there are points where they're walking indoors and going through doorways. And so one you know, particular analysis we can do is look at how these um, brain activity patterns are modulated by doorways or other things using computer vision and artificial intelligence, um, deep learning algorithms, et cetera. Another uh, study that we are doing is trying to see how the, um, these activity patterns are related in two individuals who are simultaneously being recorded. So in that first study I showed you, the participant was in the corner of the room observing Matthias, who does not have an electrode implanted in his brain. However, if we brought in two people who, who have electrodes implanted in similar areas in the medial temporal lobe, we can look at the synchrony or the interaction perhaps between those two brain activity patterns. Uh, and in this study, we've already tested the setup. So we have, you know, we have solved the technical challenge of synchronizing two uh, systems, you know, mobile uh, intracranial EG systems. And um, so now we are able to pilot the task. And the task that we're developing is a series of different conditions where they watch uh, each other walk through the environment, um, mimic each other uh, through that environment, also walk together in the same environment, and uh, watch a non-human object uh, walk through these, walk through the environment as well. Um, we are no longer using this virtual object, we actually have a real object that is, is controlled and maneuvering through the space um, 
in, in, in the similar types of trajectories. So to be continued, hopefully we perhaps uh, by next year, we'll have interesting data on this project. And then I, I believe this maybe second to last uh, study I wanted to mention is that we also are working with several engineering collaborators to develop better ways to record activity in freely moving humans. And this is a system that we've been working on for I'd say like eight years or seven years now. Um, really when I started my lab, the year before I started my lab, through a, a program to develop an implantable device that can record single neurons. And so this is a device that we call the NeuroStack uh, because it's sort of like stacks of cracker-sized cracker chips that are um, uh, put on top of each other and can fit in the palm of your hand. Uh, this device is able to not only record single neuron activity, but intracranial, you know, LFP activity, EEG activity through microwires uh, that are connected, you know, to an individual ep epilepsy patient in the EMU. It can also stimulate with a range of different parameters. I I'd say the major advantages of the system over existing is that you can create any kind of pulse shape that you want and also um, record during stimulation with a really large range of parameters. You can also record several channels simultaneously or select how many you want. We've recorded uh, from this device in uh, stationary individuals as well as walking uh, simultaneously with, with the existing you know, clinical recording devices and, and shown that the, this, the activity patterns are similar between the NeuroStack uh, and the existing system. And we've also identified, you know, single neuron activity, like spiking activity uh, while individuals are walking around. And um, this is very exciting to us because, uh, you know, we, we haven't been able to get this kind of data before and it opens up the door into asking questions about single neuron mechanisms of freely moving behaviors and spatial navigation. So here's some example units. The individuals in this case were just walking back and forth in the hospital room. Um, but could easily walk down the hallway. They often go for walks, uh, you know, in, in their two week stay in the hospital, uh, especially after the seizures have been collected. So we're excited by this in the sense that it, it, it hints at a future where we can do these kinds of studies and record single neuron activity as well as LFP data in freely moving humans and start to really bridge findings between animal studies and humans and also test human specific questions or questions that are perhaps more suitable to test in humans that uh, don't require a lot of you know sort of cognitive preparation or training in that you can simply instruct uh, humans to do a particular task. So we are working on a miniaturized version of this system that uh, looks like this. It's actually been prototyped and developed. Um, but we haven't tested, you know, bedside with humans yet and uh, just submitted a grant to get more funding for this. And so this system, which we call MIND, uh, is a miniaturized system of, of this one that can actually be implanted. And so as you saw in the, in the earlier slides, that bulky device that is implanted in the skull, uh, this one is, you know, many, many times smaller and presumably, you know, much safer in terms of surgical risks. So once that is implanted, let's say in epilepsy patients, which there are thousands of them uh, in, in the US, um, then you have an opportunity to do, you know, research, uh, ask research questions about single neurons, at least for some time, as long as it can be held uh, in humans. But the device also has a lot of other capabilities in terms of stimulation that can be useful for testing and developing new neuromodulator modulating uh, therapies. All right, so an exciting future perhaps, hopefully not uh, too long, or at least in my lifetime, we can get some of this data. Now I told you that these devices can also stimulate electrically and we have uh, several avenues in our lab to explore the effects of stimulation on memory. We, uh, I, I list a few different papers here. Um, all in all showing that stimulation to either microelectrodes or macroelectrode contacts seems to have the effect of improving memory uh, in these three studies. And the effect seems to be strongest when the, uh, when the stimulation electrode is placed within this area here or the angular bundle, which is the white matter 
between the entorhinal cortex and the overlying hippocampus. And in this study, we found that uh, across a, a few different tasks, so we, we did a object you know, recognition memory, we did person recognition and face name association memory. We also had a verbal memory task that's unpublished that shows similar effects in that memory is improved when stimulation is delivered to electrodes that are in the uh, white matter. In this case, in the right hemisphere, these are all visual spatial tasks, <clears throat> excuse me, in the verbal memory task, we see it more so on the left side. So we have a bunch of um, projects looking at stimulation and how it can potentially modulate memory or neural activity, both using invasive recordings and non-invasive uh, methods as well. And then lastly, and if I have a few minutes left, uh, I'd like to introduce a slightly totally different topic, which is uh, using recording and stimulation uh, for memory, but not in the case of episodic memory, but in the case of um, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder where memories are unfortunately uh, you know, not able to be forgotten. And so what we're what I'm showing you here is uh, recordings in patients who have treatment refra refractory PTSD. So no other treatments have benefited uh, their symptoms. And what we found is that theta activity, but not in the hippocampus or internal cortex, but in this case, the amygdala, seems to be modulated by aversive and symptomatic events. So here is a task just looking at emotionally valenced images, some that are you know, trauma reminding uh, versus you know, neutral versus positive images. And if you look at the negative images versus the neutral or positive images, we see an increase in theta power in these treatment refractory PTSD patients. We also see it in epilepsy patients, perhaps with a, a little bit more variability. We have a lot more participants in this case. In this case, we, we have four contacts um, that are represented. Here's an example of one of those contacts showing increased power right around here after the onset of the image in the theta range. Uh, these patients were implanted with electrodes for PTSD, so not epilepsy, and uh, they are planted with the same system that I showed you in the beginning, this RNS system that was used to treat epilepsy in, in epilepsy patients, but in this case, we're looking at it for PTSD. Uh, to further um, you know, ask whether this theta power is related not only to aversive images, but to symptomatic events, we tracked, uh, we measured the theta activity during symptomatic events in the PTSD patients. So these were moments where they felt uh, that they were being, you know, sort of having a PTSD or flashback episode. They were able to mark those events at home, and we uh, see this increased theta activity to those events as well. We also brought them in and walked them through their trauma in an exposure session. A psychiatrist uh, did this. And we have also a control session where they, where they listen to a neutral uh, a memory that they uh, had, but of, of a neutral valence. And so we find that this theta activity is also increased during these trauma scripts versus neutral scripts when they're basically being walked through their trauma as well as um, walked through a previous neutral memory. And then last but not least, we find that when we turn on the stimulation um, and do this task, this emotionally valence stimuli task before and after stimulation, in one of those patients who showed a, a strong clinical improvement with stimulation, so this is the clinical score for PTSD, and it's reduced pre-stim compared to post-stim, we also see that their theta power uh, specificity to these negative images in this task is also reduced. So it's the same task, but different images presented, you know, a, a month or two apart before and after stimulation, we see this decrease in this uh, negative versus positive neutral theta power. Suggesting that this theta activity that we see in the amygdala is related to their symptomatic episodes, which can be improved uh, if the stimulation is effective. By the way, the stimulation is um, closed loop uh, and it's being triggered by these electrodes, low frequency power. In the other patient who is not showing so much improvement also did not show this change in uh, theta related power to negative stimuli. All right, so just a preview in some of the studies we're, we're doing right now, but we have a lot of other 
uh, collaborative projects, looking at other types of uh, behaviors, you know, such as sleep and, um, you know, reward, eating, social interaction, et cetera. This is the team that's done all of this hard work. I'd like to um, highlight a few of them. Matthias uh, Stangl is a postdoc, Oros Topolovic, who's an enge electrical engineering graduate student and helped develop a lot of the technical aspects of these platforms, and then several other uh, graduate students who are leading the projects I've shown you. Uh, this work does, does not, is not possible without several collaborators, clinical collaborators, scientific collaborators, uh, and industry collaborators as well as the funding, of course, is what makes it all happen. Um, there's a long list of collaborators, so I just put them all here and uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Nanthia. Um, I, I have go gone ahead and sent over a quick um, a link reminder for the trainee Q&A room that we're going to be meeting in. Um, and so let's, we'll be reconvening there at 1 p.m. Um, Nantia, this is a good time for you to take like a break. I know you've been okay, talking for a sure. long time. Um, and, and we'll just meet at 1 p.m. So, it, and, and I'll leave this room open. So if anyone has any additional questions, please post them in the Q&A chat and I'll make sure to bring them on over. Okay, so we're gonna, they're gonna save somehow these q and I just really- I've been, Exactly, I've been just, I've been just keeping track. <laughs> okay. It's well, a low tech, it's a low tech solution. Yeah, great. Um, so link. I just exit and go to that link. Exactly. I just emailed it to you as well. Thanks. No problem.